I got a score to settle with these Legion dudes. I'm ready to go after them like a giant ten tentacled robot with rainbow machine guns on fire! This year in gaming, we've been treated to a ton of high quality remakes, remasters, and sequels, as well as a massive pile of killer indies. And although the last few months have shown us one banger after another, we haven't had a really good guy in a van game in quite some time. You know what we mean. I'm talking about a game where you take on the role of a strategic commander in charge of a highly skilled group of specialists and order them around in turn-based combat over a satellite feed, usually with the goal of bringing down some kind of overwhelming force like a alien invasion or a military coup. You're John Economos, except maybe more competent. You're the guy in the van. Yeah. Modern games like XCOM, or more recently Phantom Brigade, can feed that strategy craving to a point, but nothing quite satisfies my appetite for strategy like an old favorite, Jagged Alliance 2. With its action movie cheese, silly dialogue, explosive gore, deep strategy RPG elements, and massive scope, Jagged Alliance 2 has been long regarded as the underground king of this cult classic subgenre. And while the 10, yes, 10 games in the series that followed it never really lived up to its majesty, we've been graced with a sequel ambitious enough to slap that big red number three on the end of the Jagged Alliance brand name. In the interest of full disclosure, Jagged Alliance 3 is a deep and absolutely massive game, and while we did get a review key for this one, THQ Nordic sent it a couple days after release. So I went ahead and bought a second copy, that way we could also evaluate the co-op experience. Here's my playtime as of this video, which probably represents about half of the content, and there's already a pretty decent amount of replayability and quests that can turn out in different ways, and it kind of warrants a second campaign. You can consider this to be more of a review in progress, but we've definitely played enough to talk about where the game shines and where it falls short. Stick around as we take you on a little vacation through Grand Chien, admire its majestic beauty, and chat with the interesting locals. We'll find out together if this alliance has what it takes to snatch the strategy crown off of its predecessor's worthy noggin. My name is Boss Sauce. And I'm Roland Coons. And together, we, we are, are the Two-Headed two Hero. Jagged Alliance 3 is the, oh, I must be reading this wrong the 14th entry in the Jagged Alliance series, and the game recently dropped onto Steam to surprisingly little fanfare. While the Jagged Alliance brand has slipped through many fingers since Jagged Alliance 2 dropped onto prehistoric PCs, my god I feel old, the latest entry is under the development umbrella of Hamamont Games, and backed by the publishing prowess of THQ Nordic. Ian Curry, the creator of the original Jaggeds, is here to keep us from f***ing things up, so we don't piss off our Jagged fans out there. Hamamont wasn't a real familiar name to me, with their biggest name in the game scene being the well-regarded island management series, Tropico. And here they are, with the fate of one of our favorite franchises in their sweaty little hands. Any developer that attempts to wrangle the throw-everything-at-the-wall design of Jagged Alliance 2 is gonna have their hands full, and recapturing that late 90s, early aughts magic has proven elusive time and time again. So has Hamamont Games made a worthy successor? Let's get stuck in and find out. Hey, make sure you save some action points so you can overwatch the rest of this review. The game opens in a far away time of early 2001, in the fictional South African country of Grand Chien, which is French for Big Dog. This region is known for three things, hot sun, icy diamonds, and angry warlords. As the first scenes fade into view, our eyes pan over a sloppy desk as an ancient answering machine rattles off exposition through its crackly speakers. The president of Grand Chien has been kidnapped by rogue military forces known as the Patriotic Legion, who have started a military coup under the direction of a mysterious figure known only as Le Major, French for the Major. Emma LaFontaine, the president's daughter, and the crackly voice on the other end of the answering machine, wires you a stack of cash and hires your tactical services in order to answer the burning question, are you a bad enough dude to rescue the president? Now this sounds like a dated early 90s action movie approach to a premise, because it is, and the developers fully lean into this by blowing through the fourth wall with a fully loaded magazine of Y2K era references, 
Star Wars jokes, and even some light socio-political jabs. But the stakes are much more morally gray. For starters, Corazon Santiago, the scar-faced representative from Adonis Corp, incentivizes you to retake the diamond mine interests, and there is definitely something going on with her whole deal. Please excuse me, I must take this. Yes. No! Just tell them to wait! Just tell them to wait, goddammit! <clears throat> My apologies. Where were we? Did you get some bad news? It was... well, it was nothing that concerns your mission. Talking to the villagers also reveals that the president isn't always very highly regarded by everyone, and there are even some that sympathize with Le Major's views. There's a huge cast of strange and shady characters that you'll interact with over the course of this adventure, many with their own problems that they'll ask you to help solve. And while part of your job is to sway the fate of the country through brute force, you'll also help decide the fate of Giant Dog through a variety of RPG-style side quests, strategic decisions, and moral or usually amoral choices. Jagged Alliance 3 does a pretty good job of adapting the gameplay formula of its forebears. At face value, it's framed as a squad-based strategy game. You move your little mercs through various villages, jungles, bunkers, and savannas and get into territory skirmishes with the forces of the Legion, advancing square by square through the overland map in an attempt to beat back their zones of control and topple the regime of Le Major. We gotta beat off Le Major. Are you a bad enough dude to beat off Le Major? <laughs> <laughs> Combat is the meat of the game, and it's fairly deep. It basically exists in two phases. Stealth and, um, not stealth. Unstealth. Stealth killing is a little more involved here than in Jagged Alliance 2, mainly because there's no active pause toggle. This can make it a little tougher to coordinate your sneak attacks, as it comes down to a matter of timing and skill but melee and knife attacks can be sort of primed to go off when your commando gets close enough to the target. When I was playing this, actually, I, I didn't actually pick up on that, so once I figured that I could prime the stealth attacks out, that's when actually doing some stealth takedowns started making sense to me. I mean, we'll get into it later, but stealth attacks are nearly impossible to do in co-op because you need like a really good level of coordination. You'd probably need to have it streaming on another screen. When a takedown doesn't outright kill the unhappy victim of your, of your stealth murder, the enemy becomes surprised, giving you a second chance to finish them off before they sound the alarm. Things will get loud, it's inevitable. Fortunately, all the guns are incredibly satisfying to use, in no small part due to the sound design. The staccato bratatats from the crusty World War II weapons in the early game, beefy bolt-slapping AK reports, and the powerful bass drum beats of a machine gun emplacement all sound absolutely fantastic. Environments can be completely decimated by the passage of bullets and bombs, sending clouds of debris flying everywhere. Enemies scream in pain and shout threats and insults at you when they're hit. The action is definitely R-rated, with blood and body parts flying through the air as the forces clash. It's absolute chaos. Fun chaos. Someone is going to die. Of fun! These additions are what particularly remind me of the Silent Storm series, where you can shoot through floors and walls as long as one of your teammates can tell you where the enemy that you're aiming for that you can't see is located. And then you can actually destroy walls with grenades and explosives and, you know, kind of alter the terrain. Yeah, and at the end of an encounter when everything is absolutely leveled, it looks awesome. Like, it looks like you have been here and you have wrecked a path. You have destroyed these shacks. Well done. Here's your money. Yeah. Mercs can also aim at different body parts to cause momentary debuffs when hit. So you can go nuts and take enough groin shots to rival a Van Damme movie or zero in on the head, which sometimes results in an explosive shower of gore, just like it did back in JA2. Ashes to ashes. What a spectacular way to die. Accuracy is governed by a soldier's specialties and stat levels, but I found that by playing it smart with grenades and using cover to your advantage, obtaining a high level of success was possible against overwhelming odds even with the recruit level mercs. 
Hover comes into play for all combatants, and sometimes you can get lucky hits on the odd exposed body part or destroy flimsier cover altogether. Certain weapon types also have special move and fire abilities or overwatch modes, allowing you to set up deadly machine gun ambushes or remain a threat while on the move. One of the Jagged Alliance series' strengths has always been in its characters, and a lot of care was taken to make them feel convincing and alive. All the mercs are fully voiced again, and they're individually modeled. They each have their own backgrounds, preferences, even psychological issues. Some mercs perform better if you hire their buddies, others will get pissed off if you don't keep them busy, some others will get pissed off at choices you make. This is all reflected in the newly streamlined morale system, which affects the soldiers on both sides of the conflict. High morale is gained mostly by blowing away your opponents and grants bonus action points, while low morale is caused by stuff like teammates dying or taking wounds and can cause the troops to panic, lose control, and go berserk. The panicked shouts of teammates losing their nerve, or from the enemy soldiers realizing they've messed with the wrong mercs, really do a lot to draw the player into the conflict. Enemy AI is important in games like these, and it's difficult for devs to walk that tightrope between brain-dead enemy forces that don't pose much threat, and super soldiers that are tooth-grindingly tough to fight. On the default difficulty, the AI performs fairly well for the most part. The Legion soldiers normally do a fine job of sticking to cover, avoiding your Overwatch firing cones when they can, but not so much that they're not useful, and taking advantage of crossfires and mixed unit tactics to keep the player guessing. They mostly avoid the pitfalls from the earlier AI in Jagged Alliance games, which often featured some boneheaded moves and relied more on spongy health bars or heavy armor later in the game. The enemies of Jagged Alliance 3 still occasionally suffer from these computational brain farts and run out into the open or take risky shots in close combat, and the game often makes up for their shortcomings with sheer numbers. Still, this feels like a minor complaint at most, since tearing through enemy lines by using your squad of highly skilled super specialists and their signature moves feels really fast and fun. Every single character also has a special ability as well as trainable skills that can be unlocked when leveling up. These are all extremely useful, like Livewire's ability to mark all enemies in a sector that's been scouted, or Barry's extremely powerful custom grenades that blow dudes into chunks. Blood has a throwing knife skill that kind of turns him into a chainsaw with legs. Plus, he constantly makes food references, so what's not to like? Brains everywhere! Man, now I want noodles. The special abilities, along with the personalities, specializations, stats, and even individual preferences of each merc, all need to be taken into consideration when building your team. I really think that was completely hot! Once the messy desk intro plays out, you're face to face with an ancient looking laptop screen, which is how you get into your first team building exercise. And this is where your team customization begins. Browsing profiles on the AIM website can give you a good overview of who to hire, and most can be hired for the right price. And some will tell you to fuck off, like Grizzly who won't work with people that are not American, or Grunty who will not work with teams that are all level one. However, if you do a little clicking around in the game's fake version of Outlook, you'll find an invitation to take a personality exam. This is probably the most expensive personality exam you'll ever take, but it's well worth it. Dropping some dosh on this feature lets you take a silly online quiz to generate your own custom mercenary, complete with your mandatory stupid name and optional Ted Lasso mustache. In addition to gaining a powerful squad mate, the best part about having this merc around is you never have to pay them again. After team selection, the game gets you stuck in right away on Erdney Island, a tiny tropical paradise overrun by raiders and bandits and completely bereft of birds. You do a little looting, a little shooting. After the last body has fallen and the smoke begins to dissipate, you can wander around the map to look for additional gear and go through the pockets of the dead. Sector maps are somewhat small, but many have secrets to uncover or entire underground areas to explore. A simple key press brings up an overview of any intel uncovered on the sector, a new feature that feels right at home. Sometimes there's the odd NPC to talk to as well, and this brings us to the heavy RPG adventure game influence in the game. Jagged Alliance 2 had a few limited conversation options you could tap into for certain important NPCs, but Jagged Alliance 3 supersedes this system in every respect. Instead of a couple possible canned responses, you have entire visual novel-style dialogue trees, 
complete with voice acting and these beautifully drawn character portraits. Keeping in line with the series tradition, these are normally very silly. And that's all part of the fun. Special items you may be interested in acquiring. You see, I have an innovative approach which one day will become the future of commerce. I'm trading only in loot boxes. Oh, yes! These dialogues are not just window dressing. Many contain trade options or skill checks, and different dialogues can appear based on your character's personality traits. Your teammates will all chime in with helpful advice or poignant remarks, letting you know how they feel about an individual or situation. Interactions like these can also have far-reaching consequences, resulting in unexpected deaths, side quest opportunities, gain or loss of loyalty from the civilian settlements, or even the ability to recruit secret characters to your squad later on. Adding more player choice makes the game so much more personable, adding depth to the setting and its characters and bringing it more in line with traditional CRPGs. Although not quite at the same level of production, this reminds me of the excellent dialogues in Wasteland 3, or even throwback classics like Baldur's Gate. It's important to note that Ernie Island is a perfect self-contained tutorial for the entire rest of the game. The Flag Hill map introduces you to stealth, combat, and conversations, as well as presenting you with a choice that can come back to cause trouble for you later in the game. There's a section with a sniper to teach players about the importance of line of sight, and a jungle section contains a timed battle to teach about reinforcements, as well as a bunker that demonstrates the underground sectors. The village of Ernie introduces side quests, which in turn can have more far-reaching consequences and demonstrates the importance of training militia for defense missions. Completing all of the side quests in this little island demonstrates that gaining favor in the settlements decreases the defense level of the enemy outposts, making them easier to capture. Finally, the island teaches the player the importance of ports, which make it possible to use waterways to travel through long distances quickly. Here's the satellite map. The first time I saw this thing, I was blown away. The map is massive, and given what we've already learned on exploring the sectors, there's a lot to do here. I've seen other reviews clock this as a 100 hour game, and I would not be surprised in the least if this is true. This is also where you do important maintenance on your squad, because, as we all know, mercenaries don't last long unless you rotate their tires and change their oil every few thousand miles. Kidding aside, this is where you order your squad to heal up, rest, fix items, raise militia, and craft useful stuff out of the various junk and resources you find in the game world. Once you've unlocked a little bit of intel for a sector, often you will see all kinds of points of entry, where all the enemies are, good spots to shoot them from, all that kind of thing. Kind of almost feels like old Rainbow Six games where you like know what to expect on the battlefield and then you have to plan out how you are going to break into it. The inventory, crafting, and management systems here are way more streamlined than they were back in the JA2 days, and this conquers my biggest complaint with the previous game. When you're in a sector with a workbench, explosives experts can craft enough different types of ammo and bombs to make anybody's inner pyromaniac drool. Mechanics can modify nearly all of the game's glorious guns right from the inventory screen at any time with an absolute ton of different options, provided you have the right parts and the right know-how. Gun porn enthusiasts, rejoice! Juggling resources becomes more prominent and important once you reach the mainland. These mercenaries aren't gonna work for free, and you'll need to keep them geared up and healthy. This might mean scrounging the countryside for useful parts, or medicinal green herbs, or buying ammo and grenades from one of the open-air markets. Meds and parts are a secondary currency that can be cashed in for some quick buckaroos, but the majority of your funds will come from taking over diamond mines for Adonis Corp, who gives you a cut of the profits to fund your venture. And if you find the management sections to be more of a pain than a pleasure, don't despair. The first thing you'll notice when starting a new game is this absolute wealth of difficulty options, making this one of the most accessible SRPG titles in recent memory. A ton of these little checkboxes toggle the quality of life features designed to lessen or expand the impact for nearly all the components of the game. Want to play an Iron Man campaign? Go ahead. Hate the overworld management layer? Make it easier. And if this isn't enough, Steam Workshop support has already rolled out with more mods and tweaks even though the game's only been out for a matter of weeks. Beyond all the difficulty options, you can always fall back on one of the most comprehensive autosave features I've ever seen. 
JA3 autosaves pretty much all the time, at the end of a combat turn, at the beginning of a new day, when a sector is entered, and so on. This beautiful beast right here allows you to profile your save games by naming your playthrough, and therefore experience the ultra-rare phenomenon Multiversal Save Scum. This, of course, can be toned down or turned off completely for the diehards amongst us. And if that's still not enough customization for you, Jagged Alliance 3 allows one massive inclusion, drop-in two-player co-op. Together with a buddy, you can wage war on the patriotic legion of Grand Chien and put your heads together to take the fight all the way to the major. It's the perfect addition for our two-headed approach. Or is it? Well, apparently the co-op mode was flat out broken on release, causing some minor review bombing on the Steam page, but this was patched pretty quickly. In fact, it was patched before I got a chance to play. Unfortunately, the co-op is still a little bit half-baked and runs into connectivity problems. It also seems to pop a resync dialogue even when the game is functioning perfectly fine, which was curious. That was our experience. A few limitations in co-op also caused some headaches. The inventory management becomes really cumbersome as it was definitely not designed for two people to use at the same time. And the fact that the game pauses every time the other player has a dialogue window open on the sat view is a little annoying. Since there's no way to accommodate two squads attacking two different sectors, all the co-op action has to take place within a single sector. Doing stealth maneuvers with two people turned out to be basically impossible, requiring even more split-second coordination than they did in the single-player experience. And I understand why they don't allow two players to just play the single-player game entirely. It would be impossible because of the design. Yeah, so it'd be like 40 minutes of sitting around looking at the sat map, and it's just not feasible. Yeah, it makes sense. So the best way to play co-op might just be to phone up your buddy when it is time to take down a difficult sector. Look, even with these minor issues, there is an incredible amount of depth and a big realm to explore. I'd find myself staying up late just to explore one more little sector, wondering which wacky character I'd meet next and what secrets were waiting to be uncovered. Everything just fits into the recurring theme of Jagged Alliance 3's design. An emphasis on playing the game your way. Well, Annie, looks like you've got your gun. You know, from the the musical. Do, do you like musicals? Now, we want to talk about the story and tone of the game at this point, which is basically impossible to do without a few minor spoilers. We're going to keep it to a minimum because honestly, every conversation in the game feels like a little bit of a spoiler. And we do feel like there's something interesting at work here in the game's narrative, even when it's at odds with its own tone. Based on what we've shown you so far, JA3 might already be a buy for you. So at this point in the video, if you want to experience the story completely for yourself, and avoid the spoiler skeleton. Skip to right over here. But we'd highly recommend you come back and watch this part after playing the first two or three hours of the game. The storyline of Jagged Alliance 3 seems like fairly standard 2000s era action movie cheese on the surface. But the longer I stop to think about it, the more dark and disturbing questions start to stick their knife points into the back of my mind, stealth kill style. The player is put into the role of a leader, of a private military contractor, a gun for hire basically. While your generic player character is pretty much a blank slate, there's no question that they are only involved with the fate of Grand Chien because they're getting paid to do so. The reputation of your team in the eyes of the country's inhabitants and government figures is completely secondary to doing the job that you were hired to do the rescue of the president and removal of the major. This is a far cry from the normal video game tropes of casting the player as some kind of chosen one or world-saving folk hero that has to kill God. Your merc is technically hired by Adonis Corp, a rich corporation which has large regional interests in the diamond mines of Grand Chien. Within the first 30 minutes of the game, it's clear that Adonis prefers you restore the president to power due to his sympathies and prior dealings with their business, but there's some intentionally clumsy foreshadowing involving Corazon Santiago that shows this likely isn't the whole story. One other item of interest is, you're not the first team that Adonis has sent to Grand Chien, and you find this out very early on. After pushing back Legion forces from Ernie Village, you find out from many of the inhabitants that they don't particularly care about or like the president. Many view him as weak, as a puppet to outside influence, Adonis, or simply just don't care whether he lives or dies. While a lot of the locals view the Legion as nothing more than a big bloodthirsty group of bandits, 
Some villagers seem to be sympathetic to the Major and the patriotic Legion of Grand Chien, seeing them as strong, capable fighters that are looking to drive foreign influence out of their lands. And here you are, literally fresh off the boat and ready to do some quote-unquote liberating on behalf of a rich foreign corporation. This is the point where I had to stop and ask myself, are we the baddies? Watching a movie with morally gray characters, like one of Guy Ritchie's earlier works, for example, puts you in the role of the audience, an observer. You're allowed to simply take away from the story what you will when it closes, and decide on how you feel about the plot and characters by yourself. Jagged Alliance 3 takes a morally gray conflict where it seems that no side is completely in the right or motivated by pure intentions, and thrusts the player straight into the middle of it like a rusty bayonet. The game never expressly tells you how to act or what to do, even though there's some slight encouragement to do the more humane thing in any critical juncture the game presents, there's also value to making the less humane choices for short-term gain or lateral rewards that help you reach the end goal. Enough agency of choice exists here to make the story your own, but by placing the character in the combat boots of a morally gray character, they have no choice but to become a participant in a morally gray setting. Morality systems in games are a deep and interesting subject that really warrants its own discussion, with a ton of them missing the mark completely or tripping over themselves when it comes to narrative dissonance. If this is something you'd like us to cover in a future video, or if you have some thoughts about it yourself, let us know down in the comments. Conflict diamonds are central to the game's mechanics. They pay the mercs, they buy the ammo. In the 90s and early 2000s, wars motivated by the diamond trade were a real-life thing, and likely still continue to be in certain parts of the world. It's not hard to see some parallels here between Grand Chien and 90s-era Sierra Leone, an actual country where conflicts over diamond mines were widespread. An entire Oscar-nominated movie was made about this by the name of Blood Diamond. This highlighted the atrocities inflicted on the local peoples in the name of the diamond trade, including the disfigurement and wholesale slaughter of civilians and the use of slave labor in the mining process. It's a tough watch for sure, and Jagged Alliance 3, with its setting deeply inspired by the real world Sierra Leone Civil War conflict, had an opportunity here to make some serious commentary about the practices surrounding the diamond trade. Jagged Alliance 3, or at least the first 20 to 40 hours of Jagged Alliance 3, does not do this whatsoever. Instead, what we get is the action comedy popcorn flick equivalent to the films of the 80s, like Commando, which featured Arnold as an oiled up ex-Special Forces dude that blasts his way through a banana republic while spouting witty one-liners. Jagged Alliance 2's fictional South American country, Arulco, definitely found inspiration here, and other than the locale, nothing else has really changed as far as JA3's setting is involved. The developers likely knew that this setting could be contentious, which is why the game starts off with a disclaimer screen in order to persuade players to turn off the critical thinking parts of their brains and enjoy the ride. Those expecting a gritty and serious examination of the blood diamond trade or mercenaries or private military companies will likely feel that this has tonal whiplash. Violence is cartoonishly over the top. The characters, and especially the mercs themselves, all have lots of snappy one-liners and silly dialogue that would fit right in with the films they were inspired by. There's plenty of fan service and recurring characters from the previous games, and an absolute ton of referential humor. Some longtime fans might catch the various in-jokes or even have an idea in their head what the true identity of Les Majors could be. Still, I've already seen some articles that complain about the humor taking away from the game, and if you simply can't tolerate action movie cheese and silly side quests in your RPGs, this just might not be for you. Overall, I found the jokes enjoyable and endearing, with the exception of a few cringy moments and characters. If nothing else, humor is subjective and your mileage may vary, and likely will. That's how the world is. If we all liked the same things, there'd be two really busy people. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the presentation. There's little to say about the sights and sounds of Grand Chien that we haven't already touched on, but a few more details do come to mind. As far as the visuals are concerned, the environments look wonderfully detailed. Much of that detail can be decimated by weapons fire in a spectacular fashion. There's a rich amount of variety in the biomes, and some of the set pieces are not only impressive to look at, but have tons of hidden nooks and crannies to explore. Weather effects like dust storms and rain all look great, and they even have a bunch of different effects on the battlefield. Character models are also detailed and even show equipped guns and headgear. I really appreciated the different ways mercs can move in the environments, 
vaulting over barriers and sliding into cover, but some of the combat animations are a little bit jerky and wooden. Explosions look nice, and when mercs or legion soldiers get blasted, they are absolutely drenched in bright red blood, which gives off a vibe somewhere between an old kung fu movie and a paintball bachelor party gone horribly off the rails. Unfortunately, I did run into some frame rate drops when playing the game on ultra settings, but taking down some of the post-processing effects brought it back to a consistently smooth 60 frames. Then there's the visual novel style dialogues, which might be sorely missing some emotive expressions and animation, but look quite good on their own for the most part, even though a couple are really, really goofy. Thor looks like a guy that got lost on his way to Burning Man and has an incredibly stupid expression. Yeah, I like a burrito, so with no rice on it and um, no meat, and then you can have vegetables, like anything that was green, but any red vegetables, I don't want. When you wrap it, don't use tin foil. And every time I see Barry's face, I think of a grumpy dad that just told you to finish those vegetables. I want to see a clean plate, mister. Finish your vegetables and then say your prayers. The voice acting really brings these to life. No familiar names really jumped out in the voice acting cast, but it's all enjoyable and it's great to see the series keeping this tradition of heavily voiced characters alive in this newest entry. We previously touched on the quality of the gun sounds, but another standout is the music. There's the military-flavored action movie tracks, which are expected, but even these are sprinkled in with subtle guitar riffs and instrumental hooks that stick with you even when the game is closed. The village music is an even bigger surprise, pulling away from the military theme in favor of awesome African folk tunes, complete with vocals. The user interface is probably the area of visuals that got the least amount of attention to detail. It does the job and looks reasonably like an operating system from the Y2K era, but a little more animation and feedback when clicking on the various buttons and menus would go a long way into making the game feel more polished on the whole. Polished on the whole. Polished on the whole is the name of my memoirs. That's the name of my album. The hiring process on the AIM website also no longer has the cheesy Skype calls that they got in Jag Alliance 2. Hello, Barry Younger. What can be done for you? Reducing them to voice only. It's a little bit of a nitpick, but it is still missed. If you've gotten this far in the video, we'd like to say thanks for sticking it out during our wild, crocodile-filled boat ride through the countryside of Grand Chien. A lot of love and care goes into our videos and we truly like making them. So if you want to hire our heads for the next adventure, click over here, kick a couple of bucks our way on our Patreon page or tip us on Ko-Fi. You'll feel good, we'll feel good. We'll all share a big fluffy internet hug. If you can't spend money, we get it. Just be sure to ring that bell and subscribe and share the video with your favorite strategy RPG fans so that YouTube sees fit to bestow us with algorithmic blessings. Let's wrap this one up so we can get to the chopper. I wasn't sure what to expect out of a new Jagged Alliance game because I've been burnt time and time again for 20 years. My God. Or whatever. Right? Seriously. <laughs> Fuck, we are old. <laughs> but Jagged Alliance 3 is above and beyond my highest expectation. Heymamont could have just slapped on a new coat of paint and added the skill trees and that would have been enough for me. And instead, what we got is a gigantic, expansive, ambitious, fully-fledged sequel that, I, as far as I can tell, restores the good name of Jagged Alliance. They've done an amazing job here in creating an experience that invokes the feeling of early aughts CRPGs while still providing a streamlined, modernized experience with lots of accessibility and difficulty options. It's less of a puzzle than something like XCOM and more like a vast playground where things explode and people say silly jokes. That's the best kind of playground, really. The developers clearly had a deep appreciation for the series and put a ton of heart and soul into making JA3 into the best game they possibly could, even with the hurdles of a smaller budget and team size. Now we're in the middle of a year with tons of quality remakes and sequels, and the best measure of quality is when a game improves so much on its predecessor that it becomes the new standard, rendering the older game obsolete. And for me, it's no exaggeration to say that Jagged Alliance 3 is one of those rare sequels that accomplishes this mission. I already told you, monsieur. I can't make it grow back. The bullet has destroyed the scrotum. Thanks again to all of you out there watching. Make sure you keep your chamber clean and your ammo dry. And we'll see you on the next Two-Headed Hero.